We are back on Morning Line. Thanks for joining us. Talking about combating addiction, the help that's out there. The Next Door is one organization that does that, helping women primarily, mm -hmm. uh, all women um, mm -hmm. that uh, are dealing with um, addiction to any number of substances. We're not just talking about opioids here, but uh, alcohol obviously mm -hmm. is a biggie, and some of the others out there, Xanax and the like. Ashley Rakestraw is with us, clinical services manager. Nita Chester is director of nursing. Carrie Frazier, spiritual wellness and alumni service, spiritual wellness. So you guys integrate religion into this? So, some of it can be a religious background for women that are yeah. coming in, but also just spirituality. So okay. helping them, um, we kind of talk about having that that hole inside, mm. and so how instead of filling that with drugs and alcohol, how do you spiritually fill that so that you're not relying on drugs and alcohol to to help with that emptiness that sometimes any of us can feel. Yeah, and we instead, all. Instead, build those spiritual practices. Like meditation. Meditation, or? prayer. Um, if they. <laughs> If our women do come from a certain spiritual or religious tradition to help them strengthen mm -hmm. strengthen those connections so they can have just one more building block in their foundation when they leave so they have that support. Yeah, and when you see them head out, I mean, I guess at that point, you just don't know. You hope you gave them the foundation and they choose to leave or their time has ended. Mm -hmm. So you, you follow them. And so they're, they're, you, as alumni, I mean, you've heard of several alumni that have done well, right? Yes, we have we have aftercare that meets on Wednesday night, so the women come back for um, an aftercare group. Mm -hmm. And like last night, we had a potluck, so they they all came, they, the ones so what's that, that came like? back. They're coming. They come back, and do they share stories about close calls or how they're doing? Or sure, they can share what's been going on in their lives. That's great. They can share when they're struggling and get some get some help or suggestions from the other women. Um, and it's a time to celebrate. Also, like when we have our potluck. That's just a time to celebrate that um, they celebrate their sobriety birthdays, how how far they've they've come. They share like if they've gotten a new job or they found a new place to live, and just all those pieces that come with being in recovery. Okay. And then certainly they rally around each other if someone's struggling and, and help them. Yeah, they all get to know each other and mm -hmm. kind of they can at least they can understand what each have gone through, I guess, to yes. some degree. Yeah. Now, some won't show up, and you said there there's some of the tragic cases, mm -hmm. too, right? They'll leave. I mean, have there been some that you can think of just off the top of your head that, you know, you, you worked with, and they left f under, you know, circumstances where you, they, were, they had to go or they were ready to go, and you thought they were equipped, and then what? You, how do you find out they've died? We find out several different ways. A lot of times mm -hmm. the women um, who have gone on and been successful in the program might keep in touch with mm -hmm. another client <clears throat> and find out that another client struggled and indeed passed away from the disease. Oh, yeah. um, sometimes the client's family will call us and let mm -hmm. us know um, that they've passed away. So we find out a, a number of different ways, but I think that's why the work we do is so important. And mm -hmm. the clinical team, and I know the medical team, and um, Everybody works really hard to understand that these interactions may be the last one we have with a client. Yeah. So what can we give them in these moments so that we don't have to get those calls anymore, that mm -hmm. that's the last of them, and we can know that all the clients are going to go on to be successful. We know that's probably not realistic, right. but if these are our last moments with them, what can we give them in these mm -hmm. moments to help them? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people, I think, right now with all the news stories, think that some of these overdoses are coming about because of uh, fentanyl being added and some more powerful drug, and some of these users don't realize it. But uh, you made a good point. After they've been through, obviously, they're not doing any drugs when they're with you guys, right? right. They have to come clean and all this. Mm -hmm. They get back out. So the problem can come up when, if they fall off the wagon, they remember what they once took. Yeah, if someone has gone through treatment, let's say they've been clean 30 days, 40 mm -hmm. days, and they use again, what they remember using is the level of heroin or the um, that they used before they came into when treatment. When they had a tolerance, mm -hmm. and, and so, so they then, were taking more. Mm -hmm. And so they, they go back to that that amount that they had used prior to treatment, and that's often then the body just can't handle it. Okay, all right, and that would be someone who's come through a treatment program. Now, the mm -hmm. others, truly, I do believe there are a lot of folks out there that are just using and haven't sought treatment, have those pills, mm -hmm. and then they get a pill that is laced with fentanyl, mm -hmm. and it's... Just whatever, they have no earthy yeah. idea what they're taking. They don't, yeah. do they? Mm -hmm. And just like that, it's, yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, that's just, uh, <coughs> I just can't imagine, especially after you've dealt with them going through the program like that. Now, who do you blame for all this? <laughs> the reason I'm asking is because I had those lawmakers on the other day, yesterday, and, you know, the, the pills out there. Now, they say that the pill mills, you know, where they're just doctors writing prescriptions, you know, and not being responsible, they're still out there, but there are not as many of them. But, um, you know, you get 
barrels of, of fentanyl, liquid fentanyl coming in from overseas. I mean, or you have the pharmaceutical companies continuing to crank out these pills. I mean, what, what do you think? I mean, you guys see these people suffering. Where are they getting the pills? And, you know, where, you know it's easy enough to deal with them and try to get them to stop. They're not easy, but I mean, that's what you do. But the supply is out there. Who do you blame? Well, I had a mentor years ago tell me that when we're talking about addiction yeah. that um, no one's to blame but everyone's responsible. <laughs> okay. And so we, all of us have a piece of responsibility and um, you know, even when we go to the doctor, do we, do we have a conversation with our doctor about what medications are being prescribed and then what, if, we, if someone does, let's have a dental procedure or a minor procedure, what do we do with the pills that are left in our, in our own homes? Are we making sure we get rid of them mm -hmm. versus just leaving them in the medicine cabinet? Um, and maybe even are we educating ourselves on what addiction, what happens in addiction and how we can be a part of being part of the solution or at least having compassion for the people that are struggling and for their families because you know we have we're serving these women but there's also their families mm -hmm. that are that are su suffering and are a part of the stigma of addiction too and so they they need care and compassion also because right. it's, it's hard to talk about if you feel like um, you're going to be judged or feel like someone's going to look at that this is a moral failing instead of that this is a disease and it's affecting our family and it's affecting lots of people's families. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's frustrating and understanding it's crucial. I know, Ashley, you, well, you just used it again, too, um, calling it a disease. I mean, I've had situation, you know, in my family. And I just got mad. Mm -hmm. I, it pissed me off. Mm -hmm. Dude, stop using them. Now, duh. I mean, he's addicted. But it, mm -hmm. it started getting me really mad about mm -hmm. understanding the devastation that was happening, seeing how you know, it was creating headaches for everyone else, mm -hmm. all right? Huge draw on society and just popping pills. And really, you get this feeling, you know, good for nothing. What the heck's wrong with you? That's, I was getting angry. Now, mm -hmm. then I, you know, learn and you understand the addiction. They don't really want to be there. But sometimes you talk to them and you get the sense that they do and they don't care. Mm -hmm. And that makes you even more mad. I'm just talking about, I, I'm guaranteeing you, other people feel that mm -hmm. same way, mm -hmm. either because they don't understand that it's truly a disease and the addiction and these I, I can't imagine anyone really wanting to be that way and there's other reasons for them to get that way. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I. I get, you just get mad. So it is a disease. You explain that to folks just so they understand. It's a disease just like, um, you know, if you have uh, some other type of illness. Diabetes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's, it's a disease that is something that we all can be susceptible for, or is it just uh, a select few that are more prone to addiction? Well, it's obviously there's a genetic component, but, you know, that's... Um, not everybody's going to take a hydrocodone and become addicted. But there are some that could. Literally yeah, so one pill, if their genetic makeup is that well, way. Well, I mean, I've had people tell me I got that buzz off that first one and it was just never the same again. It does something to the brain, literally. Because mm -hmm. they can mm -hmm. rationally say to themselves, mm -hmm. I know I shouldn't be taking these. I'm becoming um, dependent on them. But the craving is such that they just mm -hmm. cannot stop. It's, Amazing. Yeah, and, and that's what's, uh, that's what's hard for people that aren't in that situation mm -hmm. to understand. But I've come to understand mm -hmm. that's that's the way it is. These people, you know, want to stop and they can't. Mm -hmm. And I think this opiate, hopefully, one of the things this opiate epidemic has taught us is that um, pretty much everyone's susceptible mm -hmm. to it because it does. If you may start off following your doctor's prescription. But then the body starts to get increased tolerance. It, mm -hmm. The body gets used to mm -hmm. taking that medication and wants more. Mm -hmm. And so that I think that's one of the things that the opiate epidemic has kind of evened out the playing field that we can see addiction. Mm -hmm. Addiction doesn't know any. Right. Any, doesn't have any barriers. Addiction can hit any family, any socioeconomic status. It's and so that's hopefully maybe one of the things what we can learn from it is that we're all susceptible to it. It yeah. just it doesn't the genetic piece is certainly a part of it for many people, but this painkillers um, have certainly changed a lot of that for us. No doubt. Let's go to David. David, good morning. Yes. Hi David. Hi. I, I like what y'all doing to a certain degree, but 
people like me that is in chronic pain and uh, and need the, the pain medicine, the DEA and the doctors are fighting so hard to get people off the pain medicine, and they've got me cut down such a low dose. All I do is lay around and cry all the time, and uh, mm-hmm. because they they they're trying to get people off the pain medicine, but yet people like me that need it are suffering. Sure. Have you? But what are we yeah. supposed to do? So they've kind of actually. I mean, you clearly need it, and they're trying to limit the number of pills you get. That's correct. Have you ever tried anything else? I to used try to take anything? 30 milligrams of oxycodone to ease my pain. They've got me down to 10 milligrams. How long have you been taking the pills? How long have you been taking the pills? About 30 years. Okay, so and you would probably concede then that if you came off them, aside from feeling all the pain after 30 years, you're probably addicted to them, right? <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, they, they brought me down to such a low dose. Oh, yeah, that's true. They've and, been uh, I don't think I'm addicted to them now. Okay. I, I was only taking them four times a day. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Um, yeah, if people like him, I think, maybe end up suffering to some degree because they are cracking down on on the pills and the prescriptions, even though it's still very easy to get those pills. It just is. Mm-hmm. Well, and, you know, he obviously has a chronic pain issue. Right. And, Um, in a couple of classes that we have on narcotics and pain management and that sort of thing. Narcotics keep the brain from feeling the pain. So if you've had an injury and pain tells us to stop doing something, but if you're not feeling that injury, then you're going to continue to do activities that you probably shouldn't until you heal. So it's kind of like a catch-22 at times. If you've got an injury, your own pain medicine, but you can't feel what your um, mm-hmm. what your restriction should be because you're not feeling the pain. So then you just continue to injure but something. But aren't, aren't, aren't there some people that have chronic pain, be it from a back injury or something like that, that it's just never going to go away. Well, and you're always going to be in pain. And I, I, we've had people call into the show who say, yes, I've been on it for years, and I know I'm addicted, mm-hmm. but I manage it to the point where I'm not just completely getting wigged out, but I have to take my pills every day, and the alternative would be to come off it and feel the pain or deal with this addiction. But they're getting the pills legally, but you know they're taking them for the rest of their lives, mm-hmm. and there's all kinds of side effects involved mm-hmm. with these pills that are mm-hmm. awful anyway, right? But... Some people have no choice, right? There, there are there are legitimately chronic pain patients, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that at some other facilities and at the next door, you try to come from it from a holistic standpoint. How can we <coughs> try to help you with this chronic pain without giving you a medication? I know. Mm-hmm. But it's it is difficult. I'm not, you know, it breaks my heart because oh, yeah. you don't want to live like that. When someone like him, mm-hmm. it, two words: medical marijuana. <laughs> Hey, come on. That's a no brainer. Right? The hemp oil. I mean, no one, I don't care what doctor, can tell me that marijuana is worse for you than an opioid. End of story. No, guess what? No one's ever OD'd on marijuana. Did you know that? Yeah, interesting fact. You're a nurse. You should know that. You don't OD on marijuana. Now, I'm not saying the kind of marijuana that gets you stoned, but we know there's a ton of research going on on the medical marijuana, which is going to happen more here. And these alternative oils, if they can do, and I wonder, I think about someone like mm-hmm, David. Absolutely. He should try it. Mm-hmm. You know, but you can't do it in Tennessee unless you get it through the, the set state programs without, you know, getting busted. And you're not supposed to be buying it on the street if it's the regular marijuana, but the hemp extracts, and there's evidence there that that helps. Boy, if I was in pain, I don't care what the law is, I'm using it. Um, let's go to Mitchell. Mitchell, good morning. Hey, Mitchell. Yes, yes how you doing? Good, what's on your mind? Uh, I'm, a, I'm a chronic gout patient. I got chronic gout, crippling arthritis. I got depression and anxiety. Yeah, and I'm I'm on several different kinds of medication. Okay, if if this stuff they're giving us is so bad for us people that's really sick, why don't they come? I mean, can't the pharmaceutical companies come up with another alternative? Hmm. Right. Well, you guys don't work for the pharmaceutical. You mean you're talking about coming up with another pill that's mm-hmm. not addicting, or? Right, right. Yeah, I mean, well, that's what I was kind of talking about. The alternatives out there, and I guarantee you, big pharmaceuticals are looking into, you know, maybe other types of drugs, be it medical marijuana, the type of hemp oil extracts that they're looking at that may help. 
I'm of the personal belief that pharmaceuticals aren't all that interested in that because they love people having the addiction so they continue to churn out these pills and make a bazillion dollars. Are you naive enough to think that I'm wrong? So, yeah. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just not going to comment. Just let me talk <laughs> about it. We do have clients who come in with mental health and the things that these callers are talking about, and we do our best to create an alternative, and sometimes it is mental health medication management of a non-controlled substance, and mm -hmm. some of them mm -hmm. find that very successful, right. and we implement, um, we do a co-occurring program, so we treat that mental health side and the addiction side um, because they're both, they're both integrated, and we right. know it's so important to treat both, so we come up with medication management that's not, that's, you you know, non-controlled substance. We come up with coping skills. We come up with a relapse prevention plan, not just for their addiction, but for their mental health too. When mm -hmm. you start experiencing the symptoms, what do you need to do to ensure it doesn't lead to using again? Right. So there are ways in which we can help. And yeah, and it, physical therapy. I, mean, I wonder though, how many of the patients you see actually have this abuse situation because they it, it, it was spawned out of some kind of physical pain? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there is a what percentage? I mean, you know, we have the cases where someone had back surgery, they were on these pills, and then it got out of hand. How many cases are there like that, as opposed to people maybe just you know um, trying a pill at a party? For uh, women. It could be a large majority mm -hmm. of women. It, it started with pain, with pain and got out of when control. When you think about childbirth, yes. a C-section, um, <laughs> sure. a car accident, we mm -hmm. see a lot of clients that way um, who've experienced pain. A lot of women from a C-section who started on a medication, and that was it. Started, and now, is, it, is there a role here for the doctor to play when they put them on these pills to try to manage it and monitor it? No, a any doctor who prescribes a pain pill needs to recognize and educate their patient that there is the potential here for abuse if you're not careful. My doctor told me that, mm -hmm. and you know, that's why I didn't finish my bottle of uh, oxycodone they gave me for my rib cartilage. So, mm -hmm. I, I mean, that should just come with the territory, right? The education, absolutely. You have the potential to become addicted to this, and even if you just read the little labels, it will, it will, yeah. you know. But you know that depends on the physician and and mm -hmm. you know how they communicate with their patients. Yeah. It's tough. All right, we'll take a break on that note, and we come back more of your calls right after this.